Hello and welcome to the Friday, November 30th, 2018 edition of the Sands and its Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. Not all malicious spam comes in English. Brad is looking at a recent example of mal spam in Russian. Now, the technique used here is something that you're probably familiar with. It included an attached zip file and that zip file, if decompressed, then reveals JavaScript, which will then, if launched, download malware and in this case, ransomware. The ransomware is actually quite old. Brad noted that the first time he covered this particular ransomware was in 2014. So it's almost eight year old ransomware. But remember, it's not the same ransomware as eight years ago. This ransomware kept evolving and as a result, probably is still able to bypass some current controls. And of course, for the attacker, it's pretty cheap and easy to just reuse old software like this, even if the success rate is probably not all that large. Now, if an attacker can get you to click on an email link, another popular way to reach victims is malvertising. Malvertising refers to bad actors buying advertisements on otherwise benign websites and then redirecting users that visit a website to their content. About two weeks ago, security company Confiant did detect a large malvertising campaign that did exceed prior campaigns by orders of magnet. A group that Confiant refers to as Spam Club managed to redirect 300 million browser sessions, at least that's their estimate, over the space of 48 hours. The reason they were so effective was that they actually managed to get access to one of the top five ad networks. Usually these malvertising campaigns use smaller ad networks. They of course are a little bit easier to convince to then include these malicious advertisements. But on the other hand, these small ad networks are usually used by smaller, less reputable sites. Now, the ads themselves didn't really do anything malicious per se. They just redirected the user to pages that were usually then offering pornographic content. What was sort of interesting is that apparently they were trying to target iOS devices. 96% of the hits that Confiant detected came from iOS devices. You may have seen ads like this if you are browsing with iOS, the way they usually manifest themselves is that you're visiting an otherwise reputable website, but then the website essentially becomes unusable because it redirects you to these full page ads that you can really close without closing your browser tab. But well, uh, today's also Friday, so I have yet another STI student here to talk about their work. Today, that would be Andre Shorey, who worked on how being listed in Shodan does affect attack traffic. Andre, could you please introduce yourself? Hi, Johannes. Hi. Thanks very much for inviting me on this. A little bit about me really quickly. I'm a master's student at the uh, Science Institute at STI. I'm actually just about finishing uh, the last requirements for my master's degree. So um, this Shodan paper, the paper that I wrote on Shodan and the experiment that we conducted is actually the, the last uh, milestone for me. And um, yeah, I'm looking forward to, to talking about it. Yeah, so uh, this Shodan paper, uh, could you tell us a little bit what it's about and what your key findings kind of are? Very quick summary. So Shodan, for those of you that may not be familiar with it, um, is an internet connected device search engine. And its primary function is um, similar to Google in which it goes out there and it kind of spiders the web and it looks for uh, open ports and um, IP addresses uh, that answer and basically tries to identify what's on the other end. So it queries the port, uh, the, the IP in the port, and, um, and it looks at the page that comes back or the information that comes back and tries to identify the service or the server that's running behind it. And then once it identifies that, it then populates it into a, a searchable database that people can go and query and have a look at um, what it's found. Some people sort of describe it as the search engine for the Internet of Things or such, because you can find all of the 
uh, devices that are sort of connected to the internet. Now, one thing you looked at is whether or not it makes a lot of sense to block Shodan IP addresses. Uh, we set up a honeypot, so can you talk a little bit about sort of what your findings were there? Sure. Um, you know, just to, uh, again, recap the experiment that we did. Um, as uh, you mentioned, Johannes, we, we, have, we had a series of honeypots that were set up that, were, that we then made accessible to Shodan to be able to find uh, the ports that we wanted it to and the IP addresses that we wanted it to. And then we profile the traffic. And once we establish a baseline, we then blocked the traffic or we attempted to block the, the Shodan scans or not the traffic, the Shodan scans uh, in an effort to then see if there was any impact towards the traffic that was coming in. And because it was a honeypot, um, it was assumed that all traffic that was coming in constituted attack traffic. So what we wanted to see or what we were hoping to see was some kind of an impact or, or a decrease in attacker traffic on our honeypots. But I think we saw some of that, but not really uh, a lot of significant decrease in traffic there or in other attack traffic, right? Yes, that's right. Um, we, we did try to look at some kind of correlation between uh, attack traffic, uh, changes in the attack traffic patterns between you know, the greater attacks that were happening on the internet and on our honeypots. Um, we did run into a few little, little uh, challenges with that. Um, but primarily, I think the biggest challenge that we had in terms of trying to influence the traffic was that trying to block Shodan or to be able to su successfully block Shodan proved to be a lot harder, surprisingly harder than we expected initially. And in fact, um, throughout the experiment, um, we didn't block 100% of all, of all Shodan traffic, as it turned out, because um, when we looked at the Shodan database on the internet, we continued to see updates and, and new ports and new, and new IPs showing up or the IPs getting refreshed on there. So that was, that was kind of uh, some of the challenges that we ran into that, that certainly you know, made it very difficult to, to kind of effectively decrease the traffic in, the, in a way that would have been meaningful. So... There are these block lists for Shodan and you know, in the Storm Center, we offer one. They, for the most part, are based on Shodan IP addresses reverse resolving to something related to Shodan. Uh, but uh, I think you saw some IPs that appear to be part of Shodan based on the database results, but they did not reverse resolve to Shodan. Or... Yes, that's right. And, and in fact, you know, I, I kind of hypothesize that maybe this might be some kind of a fast flux behavior where Shodan then uses, uh, utilizes an IP from an unknown domain temporarily, uh, goes out and, and runs a query or it does a scan and then subsequently changes the IP and then, and then you know, puts that one either back into its own pool or, or just releases it. So I think that that may, may be a way that Shodan um, tries to bypass a lot of these block IP filters that, that, that we looked at and we found on the internet, like even the one for Inter Internet Storm Center. So, you know, a lot of the IPs um, that were running the scans were not from the Shodan.io domain. At least we didn't think so because, um, for example, um, one of the things I was doing to try and help help Shodan kind of move along, and, and I'll talk about how, how Shodan has this, this sort of inertia to it as well. But one of the things I tried to do to help thing, move things along was that um, I kept running manual scans. And then, and then um, around the time of the manual scan, I would look at all of the incoming uh, traffic to try and see, you know, any possible uh, traffic that, that looked like a, a scan and try and add that to our block list. And you know, again, a, a lot of these IPs were temporary, and and th there wasn't any discernible pattern that I could that I could figure out from one scan to the next scan, um, in order to to extract a you know an IP or even a domain and then add it to our block list. It just just seemed to persist for the scan and then disappear after that. Yeah. So. Um that inertia you talked about. So you actually paid Shodan to run scans against the Honeypot IP address range. How long did it actually take for these scans to complete and data to show up? Okay, um, Shodan basically limits manual scans to once every 24 hours on a particular IP range or even a particular IP. So, you know, that also contributes to the inertia in that you can only run a scan once every 24 hours. Um, the results from these scans as well often took you know, anything up to two weeks to be even show up. 
And in fact, some of the IPs in some of the ports took as long as a month to show up. That, that kind of delayed the work then too, because you had to wait for that scan to complete and the data results to show up before you could actually start taking a measurement. Or, yeah. yeah, that's right. That's right. And then once we implemented the block list, um, again, similarly, the reverse happened where these results would take up to, you know, anything up to a month. I, I monitored it for a month and then after that, um, I, I stopped monitoring because the experiment was over. But, you know, during the time period of the block, uh, some of the IPs just never never disappeared. They just kept, they just showed up. And and with Shodan, you can look at the last update of of a particular port or IP or the, the record in their in their database. And some of those last updates were again a, a month old. Yeah. Now, uh, one thing that surprised me reading your paper was how much of the traffic was actually due to researchers like Shodan. And Shodan isn't the only system that's doing this. Uh, that I think was sort of in a 10, 20 percent range, or what? Uh, what I remember from your paper. Yeah, the, actually, the when the, the IPs that I was able to find that were from the Shodan uh, I/O domain were actually less than one percent of all the incoming traffic that that I was observing. And um, the other scans, again, you know, from other domains, um, I didn't look at those closely, but I don't expect them to be. Um, a, a, a large quantity of what we were seeing, a large large percentage of the, the actual volume coming in. It, to me, it kind of looked like a lot of these scans, a lot of the traffic that was coming were just automated scans that people were running, um, you know, on their own, from their own servers using a script probably. But they may not have been from a commercial entity uh, or a commercial scanner like Shodan. So more stuff like Mirai or sort of these standard uh, scanners that look for inner of things devices out there maybe. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So end result, is it worth it blocking Shodan or you rather would spend your time doing something else? Uh. Well, you know, I, I have to echo the sentiment on the, on the internet, or at least the people that are in the know, people that have actually taken five minutes to think about it. it. It really is far more effective to secure your devices. Do your do your cyber hygiene. Make sure that you're you, you know you've 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 disabled the ports that you're not using. The ports that are still open are properly secured. Make sure that the authentication um, is the, the standards that you're implementing are effective, um, and and that is far more that's far that's going to have far more impact on securing your operations than just blocking Shodan. I think blocking Shodan in a lot of ways is just um, security by obscurity. You're just hiding all of the bad habits and all of the poor hygiene that you have from the internet, or you're hoping to hide it, when in fact that people are going to scan you anyways. You know, whether it's through Shodan or whether they're going to run their own scans, they're going to find your vulnerabilities. So eliminate those vulnerabilities. That's the best practice I can I can advise people to take. Yeah, that sounds like good advice. Uh, so what's next for you after graduating now? Well, um, at the moment, I'm on the job hunt, so I'm actively seeking something. Um, I'm based in Singapore, so it's a very small country, so opportunities here will take a little longer. I, I'm, I'm very hopeful that I should have something within the next six months. But, um, but yeah, you know, it's just a question of, of, of applying to as many interesting positions as I can. And, and with the credentials and with the education I have now, there are far more interesting opportunities than there were before I took the course, uh, before I took the degree. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to actually actively contributing and making a difference to, to someone's operations. That sounds great. So thanks again for joining me here. A link to the paper will be found in the show notes for this podcast. So thanks everybody for listening and talk to you again on Monday. Bye.